As we go down here, we've got the oil pressure gauge here, and it also gives fuel pressure. There's a switch that can give one or the other. Over here is oil temperature and water temperature. Depending on what direction one of those switches are put over here, these two gauges serve two particular purposes. The largest one of all, of course, is the rev counter. Just as you in your road cars have to address the speedometer to stay within the limits of uh, the law, the limits of the law for this engine is the speed of the engine. It would go up to about 11,000 revs, for example. Then we have two other gauges. This one over here gives out the number of laps left on fuel alone. In other words, out of an 80-lap race with 20 laps to go, if this gauge only read 18 laps, Alan Jones would have to back off the throttle to keep his fuel consumption down to give him the full race distance. Over here, there's another readout. This is for the exhaust temperature. And this engine is a six-cylinder engine split into two, the left-hand exhaust temperature and the right-hand exhaust temperature. There's a switch to be able to give both of those, and that is there. The left temperature and the right temperature. If these temperatures go up too high, an engine could blow. When that happens, the turbo itself would blow, and you'd see a lot of white smoke coming from behind this car. There's two idiot lights, as they call them, instead of gauges. The oil pressure, if it goes right down, would this light here, an orange light, would come on. The fuel pressure, if that was failing through a pump or low fuel, then that light would come also. There's a radio switch. This is so the driver can switch his radio on and then press this button to speak to his crew. Now a vital part of Grand Prix racing. You've also got a light switch up here which switches on the rear light in the case of rain so that cars coming from behind can see that strong high and intensity light. These two here, these two things are to adjust the pressure in the turbo because there are two turbos in this car. If the left hand turbo is going a little bit low and he would see this in this gauge, he would switch a switch to adjust by doing so, the left-hand turbo. The right-hand turbo is adjusted here so that both of them are synchronized, same way as a jet engine. There's a few other points in here that the driver has to address. The roll stiffness. If the car has got too soft a suspension roll in the front, the driver can stiffen that up by turning it to the right or soften the car off by turning to the left. The brake balance, the ratio from the front brakes to the rear brakes can be changed also because as the fuel load goes down, the weight distribution changes and he can adjust the brake balance by doing this. Then of course there's the gear shift itself, a six speed forward gear shift that he would use all the way around this course. To get into reverse gear, he would have to pull this out so that he doesn't inadvertently engage a reverse gear while going forward. It is tight in this compartment. Alan Jones, in fact, will have to work hard here on Sunday. He could lose up to three kilos in weight, all because of the physical effort and all that he has to do in his office. Jackie Stewart at the office he uh, knew and graced so well. And uh, behind us, we can hear the drivers bunding on, I guess you might say, as they arrive at their office again for the one-hour final qualifying session. It begins in just a few minutes' time. The engines uh, that they're gunning are far, rather different, though, to the ones that they'll use in the big race tomorrow. Jackie Stewart reports once more. I don't believe in bad luck. I think it's due to poor preparation. That could never be claimed of this team in the relationship to qualifying. It's excellent preparation. Masterminded by two men that have allowed Ayrton Senna to have eight pole positions this year alone. Those two men, Peter Waugh and Gerard Decarud. One a team manager, the other an engineer. And this is the equipment that allows Ayrton Senna to get those pole positions. You see these two gearboxes there? They look identical.
of qualifying is in this here. The two turbos, the one on the left is set up to do the whole distance and race boost. This little baby here is set up for those magic four laps. It's gonna make that Renault engine produce that 1200 horsepower and frankly, it's gonna burn out after only four laps. So turbo technology is really what it's all about. And just listen to that noise from a very noisy uh, Lotus garage. Jackie Stewart reporting again. We'll be back in a moment for this vital final qualifying session for tomorrow's Australian Formula One Grand Prix. My name is Michele Boreto. Stay watching the uh, Adelaide Grand Prix. It's a right vital final qualifying session down there in pit lane where they come out as they're catapulted from a giant Shanghai Ken Sparks and Vern Schuppen. Thank you very much, Mike. Well, the adrenaline is really pumping down here on pit road. And of course, we now go to the vital timing. Vern, what will the drivers be looking for? Well, of course, they're uh, looking for uh, the fastest time they possibly can uh, as each car crosses the start finish line and breaks an electronic beam, which sends a signal back to the computer in the timing car. And also, each individual pit, each driver has his own monitor to watch. So. Uh, Basically, they're just going out to, to go as hard as they can and be as near to the front as near to the front of the grid as they can for tomorrow. Of course, Mansell was first out. He's keen, isn't he? Yeah. Well, of course, uh, he's the one that's got the most on the line, so uh, he's got a lot to lot to do. Right back to you, Mike. Thanks, Ken. Well, as you watch Nigel Mansell, who is holding pole position at the moment from yesterday's session, circling the track and first out, this is the most important 60-minute final qualification session of the 1986 Grand Prix season. Because three men, Nigel Mansell, Alain Prost and Nelson Piquet, are in contention for this year's World Championship and a front row's position on the starting grid for tomorrow's last round of the championship here in Adelaide is vital for all three of them. And the track is in absolutely prime condition because with the sun shining on it all day long, it is warming up, the tyres are getting hot and for enthusiasts who are watching, the significant news is that all the top runners have got one set of C race tyres and one set of E qualification tyres. And that means to say that Nigel Mansell can probably go the whole race distance on the set of tyres that he's using at the moment if he wanted to. He won't, of course. He'll be getting the car absolutely au point for this Adelaide circuit. Then he'll put on the E's, probably towards the end of the session, and go for it, as will all the others. Yes, when they put on the E's, they've got uh, one or two laps before the very, very soft, sticky compound overheats but they hope to get a good time. It becomes a very tactical battle then. Timing is very important because they must get a clear run. If they're on a fast lap and they come on a slower car, they've ruined the tyres already and they don't get a second chance. So there is Mansell, he's warming up his seas. He'll be able to go pretty quickly on those. He'll want to establish a good time. He'll try and improve his yesterday's time on these C tyres which, as Murray says, will last him as long as he wants, really. And then when he's done that, and done a few laps, he'll go in and he will wait in the pits and he will try and time it when the track isn't too busy. You see him sliding about quite a lot, the tyres aren't yet hot. It'll take a while to come in. And then down the long straight, they build up. Here they build up to some 200 miles an hour. You see, Mansonize 
He was weaving about, that's to try and get a little bit more heat into the tyres, to warm them up. He'll probably take the second lap quite slowly as well, and then on his third lap he'll start really going for a time. Nigel Mansell's fastest time yesterday, which gave him provisional pole position on the starting grid, was 1 minute 19.255 seconds. But, significantly, Alain Prost, in the non-qualifying session this morning, went round fastest of all time at Adelaide, 1 minute 19.121 seconds, which is some four seconds inside Keke Rosberg's 1985 lap record, and faster than Ayrton Senna's pole position time last year. Well, you now watch Gerhard Berger, the Austrian, in the tremendously powerful 1,350 horsepower in qualifying trim, BMW-powered Benetton. That is the man who won the Mexican Grand Prix. Now, let's go round the lap with him. He goes from here, the start and finish point, into the S's in second gear. Then he goes round what I call Gumtree Bend for obvious reasons, down to Wakefield Turn, second gear at about 110 k's. Now into East Terrace Bend, second gear still, 110 k's, and Berger really looks as though he's pressing on. He, unlike all the other uh, drivers I've mentioned, is using Pirelli tyres and may well be going for a fast time right from the beginning. Flinders Bend, the right-hander. Now he comes up towards Market's Turn, which is a second gear, 110 miles an hour, what, 110 k's an hour turn, up to Stag Turn by the famous pub of that name. Now down towards Brewery Bend, he's doing about 150 kilometers an hour. Swings round, well, he's speeding up, but he is not on a qualification lap at the present moment. He was two seconds faster on his last lap than he had been yesterday, and it's actually put him up into fifth position on the grid as you look at the cool, calm and methodical Ayrton Senna sitting in his car. Now, Senna has got an enormous number of pole positions to his credit already in his short career. Fifteen times he's been in pole position. He's waiting to go out in his Lotus Renault on his Goodyear tyres. The Lotus pit crew getting him all ready. He's got one of the very latest Renault qualification engines behind him, which produce well over 1,200 horsepower. Now Berger's going for it. Watch him. If the target time for pole position at the present moment is that of Nigel Mansell, 1 minute 19.255 seconds. Yeah, Berger is definitely on a, on a quick one now. He's already improved his time dramatically. Making himself up into fifth place with a 120.5. Form. The BMW engine he's got behind him is probably the most powerful. See a little bit of fluid fill it, uh, just spilling out of the breather there. Hard on the brakes at the last half in and then on to full power down the pit straight. And that was just a little bit slower than uh, his first lap this afternoon. We saw out the centre just now, sitting in the pits. He would be waiting for the initial rush of traffic to die away. It's so important in this qualifying to get a clear lap. And uh, the trick is to try and get out there when most of the other people have done their run and have come in again. the pit lane the Goodyear and the Pirelli tyre technicians there incidentally is Alan Drake Jones in the cap and the jacket are testing the temperature of the tyres as they come in and the drivers stop they stick a probe right across three points of the compound of the front and rear tyres measure the temperatures 
That there is Stefan Johansson, the Swedish driver for Ferrari, who is about to drive for his last time for Ferrari in 1986 on Sunday because he has been, in the opinion of many people, wrongfully dismissed by Ferrari to make place, make room for Gerhard Berger. There's Ingenieri Tomeni just walking out of the picture. That's the man who's responsible for setting up Johansson's car. ...and exhaust temperature. There's a switch to be able to give both of those, and that is there. The left temperature and the right temperature. If these temperatures go up too high, an engine could blow. When that happens, the turbo itself would blow and you'd see a lot of white smoke coming from behind this car. There's two idiot lights, as they call them, instead of gauges. The oil pressure, if it goes right down, would this light here, an orange light, would come on. The fuel pressure, if that was failing through a pump or low fuel, then that light would come on. As we go down here, we've got the oil pressure gauge here, and it also gives fuel pressure. There's a switch that can give one or the other. Over here is oil temperature and water temperature. Depending on what direction one of those switches are put over here, these two gauges serve two particular purposes. The largest one of all, of course, is the rev counter. Just as you in your road cars have to address the speedometer to stay within the limits of uh, the law, the limits of the law for this engine is the speed of the engine. It would go up to about 11,000 revs, for example. Then we have two other gauges. This one over here gives out the number of laps left on fuel alone. In other words, out of an 80-lap race with 20 laps to go, if this gauge only read 18 laps, Alan Jones would have to back off the throttle to keep his fuel consumption down to give him the full race distance. Over here, there's another readout. This is for the exhaust temperature. And this engine is a six-cylinder engine split into two. The left-hand exhaust temperature and the right hand also. There's a radio switch. This is so the driver can switch his radio on and then press this button to speak to his crew. Now a vital part of Grand Prix racing. You've also got a light switch up here which switches on the rear light in the case of rain so that cars coming from behind can see that strong high and intensity light. These two here, these two things are to adjust the pressure in the turbo because there are two turbos in this car. If the left hand turbo is going a little bit low and he would see this in this gauge, he would switch a switch to adjust by doing so, the left-hand turbo. The right-hand turbo is adjusted here so that both of them are synchronized, same way as a jet engine. There's a few other points in here that the driver has to address. The roll stiffness. If the car has got too soft a suspension roll in the front, the driver can stiffen that up by turning it to the right or soften the car off by turning to the left. The brake balance, the ratio from the front brakes to the rear brakes can be changed also because as the 